so uh, we'll be recording this as well. The reason why is because we'll send it to you a little bit later on today. But overall, again, the participation on the webinars has been really good. We like to keep it to an hour. Uh, we always uh, give you information after the fact, that, uh, you know, whether it's the recorded version of this. We've been archiving all of our videos. Um, Chris has put together our YouTube channel, and that's specifically to the webinars that we've been doing during COVID. Um, but we'll continue this thing throughout 2020, no, no matter what. Um, it's not that I don't love seeing Jason down in LA and all of our, our, our crazy stories that we do when we do live trainings which we will continue as soon as we're able to, but for right now, obviously this suffices. But no, again, your comments to, uh, you know, what you guys would like to see in the future, um, I, we're just doing this for you guys, so, so please let us know. Um, getting to be about one minute, uh, got about getting nearly 20 guys up in here. Um, thank you guys for joining. It's, a, it's gonna be a, a fun weekend, so let's, let's get this thing done and out of the way, learn some stuff. Um, when we first put together, um, the curriculum today we wanted to, we knew there was so much with sony especially so last week was you know the virtual line show if you will really covered a lot of stuff um that is available in our archive series as well if you want to go back as well as his slide deck um from last week as well but if you were part of that then you knew that we were kind of saving a, a lot of the deeper dives um for today so um and it's funny too, Jason Savage put together a cool home studio where he's really able to show you. So for instance, today, it's not just a slide deck that's going through. So more than we did last week, for sure, this is a participatory class. Chris is here, I'm here to field the Q and A's. Don't feel, you know, just continue to, 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 to uh, interact with us today because as I'm looking forward to watching Jason's presentation today, as he goes into you know, a TV's menu, this is all going to be live. So this is all what we're seeing, what questions come up. Um, so really, this should be a fun class for, for everybody. But don't feel afraid to interrupt. Hey, we got all day. And it looks like Chris Gibby has literally all weekend to sit here and hang out with all of us, right? Hey, I'm here, I'm here all the time for you guys. I'm here to come <laughs> me whenever, all weekend. This is great. All right, we'll kick it off to Jason. Thank you, Jason, for coming. You've got the best home studio work from home studio um, going on right now, so. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm okay with setting the bar. And Gary, if you wanna go ahead and again, click on those dots where it says spotlight video so that we can lock the video or lock my video on the screen for everybody. Looks like we got that working, so yeah. awesome. So welcome to the 2020 Sony technical uh, session. This is, uh, as Gary mentioned, this is gonna be less of a PowerPoint session. Uh, this is really gonna be the only time that I appear uh, in the video today, but um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we took a few minutes to talk about a um, couple of things going on, obviously, with Sony. Uh, we know that inventory is a challenge right now for, for every manufacturer out there, uh, but we are working with the local governments uh, in Mexico and in the other places where we have these components to try to get as many boxes to you uh, as possible. I know Volutone and a lot of the other distributors around the country have taken a pretty solid inventory position uh, made a big buy-in to try to have some of those boxes available for you. So work with your local branches if you have an urgent need to try to get some uh, try to get some of those important uh, SKUs uh, in your hand, some of those important boxes in your hand. Um, as I mentioned, not a lot of PowerPoint slides here, but we've been talking about a lot of monsters uh, like COVID-19 monster here. Uh, he's rolling up behind us, but we're going to go ahead and battle him with a lot of knowledge, and we're going to battle him with some hugs and we're gonna fight off any of that negativity and try to uh, make this a positive experience for everybody. Hopefully we've all learned something uh, about ourselves and uh, bettered ourselves with all of this so that we can get back to killing it. You know, that's really what we're all here to do is to execute for our clients, uh, bring them things to entertain themselves. And, you know, part of this whole uh, initiative is really to try to arm you guys with as much information as possible. So last week, we did the sales session. This week is gonna be all about uh, technical stuff, resources, uh, and really the hits. Quite frankly, I take a lot of phone calls on a regular basis about you know, what, how, where do I do this? I'm planning for uh, XYZ projector, I need firmware. So the point of this whole session today uh, is to arm you guys with as much of that information so we can get back on the Death Star and get back to work. So bear with me here as I am driving the show from my side of things, but I'm going to share a couple of things with you here. So just bear with me for one second. Uh, 
Is that the right screen? I hope so. Looks like it's my Google screen. Yes. Awesome. So let's talk about some of the resources that are available to you guys as integrators um, that you don't need to have uh, web, you don't need to have uh, access to, uh, excuse me, you don't need a registration or anything to access. Pardon me, I'm just working with my uh, lighting situation here so that when I switch cameras, it's, uh, it's all going to work out. So but, pardon me for one second as I turn off uh, uh, the lights here in my studio slash garage. But uh, when we look here at sonypremiumhome.com, this is really the website that's got all of the info that you're ever going to need, quite frankly. So um, when we're talking about information about a TV, for example, talking about a projector, talking about a receiver, all of the cut sheets for all of this product is here. Also, so we'll just take a look here. We'll look at a A9G Master Series OLED. Scroll down. Right here in the middle of the website, right here in the middle of the web page, we've got spec sheets and cut sheets for each one of the sizes listed here and even a product video. So if you want to know what the back of a Sony TV looks like, you want to know what the, where the mounting points are and all of that good stuff, you want to look underneath the cut sheets. If you just want to uh, add marketing speeds and feeds or something like that to a proposal or you need to know a specific a bit of information about a TV, it'll be listed there underneath the spec sheet. So um, I use this website all the time when I get phone calls. Uh, so uh, if you want to save yourself the phone call, save yourself the call to um, Volutone or your local distributor branch to, hey, where do I get this? Uh, where do I get a cut sheet for a Sony TV? You can save all of that uh, phone traffic and get the information you're looking for right from sonypremiumhome.com. Another little cool thing that uh, I get frequent questions about that is also answered by this website is uh, the projectors uh, page here. So again, got the complete lineup of projectors, but of course the most common question is how big a screen can I do at XYZ with XY projector? Or um, I've got a given distance with a certain projector, is this screen gonna work? And there's a lot of websites out there for sure that uh, talk about, hey, you know, I've got all the projectors listed here, whether it's Projector Central or some other third party site. Um, but some of their information may not be entirely accurate or they may have an agenda to try to sell you a specific screen or something else that they're offering through their website. So um, not trying to say that anything is inaccurate there. I'm just trying to say that if you want something that's engineered by Sony, uh, specifically for Sony products, we have an app right here in the middle of our web page. So we have this available to you guys uh, as a mobile application. You can load on a device like a phone or tablet, of course, uh, but really handy just to be able to go to the website and kind of use the, the flash player here uh, to figure out whether you, how big a screen size you can do or what distance you can uh, you know, fill a certain size screen with. So just do a brief, uh, brief run through here of how this works. Ceiling install versus floor install. We're going to hang it from the ceiling. We're going to pick that. And then it's really just a check the boxes kind of situation here. So uh, for projector, video projectors are going to be the home cinema models. One brief thing here I wanted to mention since I've got the opportunity to do so. The other series of projectors that you see listed here are our data grade projectors. Uh, the Sony CI team is now going to be supporting this product as well. So I know you've been able to buy uh, professional grade uh, business projectors from uh, Volutone or from your local distributor here recently. However, uh, you haven't been able to get any support from our team on it. Now, uh, from, you know, from April 2020 going forward, we're able to support you uh, on all the series of projectors except for the cinema stuff. So if it's a home projector or a commercial grade projector, uh, your Sony CI rep can, can help you uh, answer those questions or help you with those projects. So click in here on video projector, we'll pick a model uh, that looks familiar to us. So we'll say that it's a 295ES. We'll tell it which screen size and which aspect we're going with. So it's a 16 by nine screen. And we'll say that it's uh, 
medium sized 120 inch diagonal and it's a 16 by nine screen. And then we get a little chart here at the bottom that'll tell us exactly what the screen size is and what the projected image size uh, will be. Click to the next slide here, then we can tell it how far away from the ceiling to the top of the image. So maybe we're at, it's a low ceiling in, in my home. So we'll just say that it's a foot. Uh, we'll click foot here. So 12 inches away from uh, the ceiling to the top of the image. Seems pretty reasonable for this kind of application. And then if we look over here uh, at the distance side of things, I can get that information in inches, meters, or feet. So again, with a 120 inch screen and a 295, 12.1 feet up to 24.7 feet. Maybe I'm not so good at uh, the 0.7s uh, in, in uh, feet. So we'll just go with inches, again, 145 inches to 297 inches. Really, really straightforward, simple way to do projector calculation right from the website. Another cool thing about this option here is that if you're planning uh, job notes for a client or you're putting together uh, some note, you know, some documentation of their system, uh, you can actually do a printout of the simulations and put it in the job notes. So for example here, the next step in the page is the shift range, shift range simulation. So you can uh, calculate for horizontal offset or vertical offset. So essentially uh, what it kind of looks like the opposite here. So choose vertical position means that I'm trying to figure out, I've got a fixed vertical uh, position. Like I know how far the projector is going to be from the ceiling. How much horizontal shift do I have? And then in this case, it's choose the horizontal position. So I'm telling the app, Hey, this is where the projector is. How much vertical offset do I have? So a good rule of thumb, uh, with a projection project is with a Sony projector anyway, never go more than 20% of your screen height, not the, not the height of the, of the actual frame, but the image. So never go more than 20% of your image height above or below the top of the screen. I see something popping up in chat there, but I, I can't uh, see it because I'm in a uh, full screen. So Gary, if you want to, read that off to me or if it's something that I can uh, answer here in a second, I'll jump on it here uh, when I stop screen sharing. Um, so we'll just look here at the horizontal position. And again, we can input where we are vertically. So we'll say that I am five inches uh, from the top of the ceiling. Click next. And then it'll give me a simulation here. So based on the data that I've input, with the standard lens, because that's the only thing that's, uh, that's available with this projector. From the ceiling to the center of the lens, I could actually almost be a foot above the top of the mount down to 70 inches from the ceiling based on my screen position. And then I'll also have uh, a slight little bit of horizontal shift uh, in the amount of five inches. So cool little way that you can use our website to calculate this uh, these kind of projects, this kind of information. And then last but not least, you've got a printout here. So you can actually take this, print it out, put it in your job notes, and it'll tell you exactly how big the image is going to be, where the image is going to land based on your calculations. So super handy uh, capability, super powerful tool. And again, it's built right into the middle of sonypremiumhome.com. So moving on from the salesy side of things to the support side of things, um, as you guys are integrators, engineers, uh, maybe you're wearing all the hats at your particular business. I'm gonna go ahead and close a couple of windows here because I don't need to have my email open in 25 different places. I'll go back over here really quickly, pardon me. So when we look at uh, the e-support page, this is where you're gonna get firmware updates for products. So maybe you don't have the automatic firmware updates uh, on the TVs turned on, that's fine. But our audio systems and projector products, they don't do automatic firmware updates. You actually have to uh, go through the process of loading the software on a USB and putting it in the unit or, you know, selecting firmware update uh, via network on the AV receivers. So where do I get that information from? Go to esupport.sony.com 
and it'll bring you to our support page. And then we've got all of our products listed here, of course, TVs and projectors being the most popular, the most common. We'll click here on this option. And then again, we're gonna see different product types listed here, or we can just search for the model number. So if I've got a VPL, VW, and you'll see it sort of populate there, 5000 ES, because I got a, got a great client that bought a really fancy projector. Um, all of the information that I'm gonna need about that product is here on the eSupport page. So um, obviously we've got the all system here. Uh, and then as we scroll down the page, system software update is listed here. Click on this tab. It'll tell us all of the things that we're gonna get with this firmware update, you know, file size and some instructions as, as to what you need to do. Um, just to give you the cliff notes, anytime you download firmware for a Sony display, Sony projector, Sony AV system, you need to download the zip file, extract that file, and then take the, the, the folder that's in the extracted file and put it in the root directory of a USB drive. And if you don't know what the root directory is, I'm sure you guys all do, but some people say, what's the root directory? Just the main file folder for the, uh, for the USB drive and just make sure that it's a blank drive with nothing else on it. Take that, load it into the display, or load it into the projector or the audio device. It'll automatically pull that information in and uh, do the firmware update for you. Other thing to know is you have to do it from a PC. For whatever reason, Apple devices put uh, secret software, put some other things that are hidden in the root directory because they don't support X, they don't support FAT32, they support XFAT, which is uh, some hybrid file that uh, for whatever reason, Sony displays and Sony products just don't like, don't dig. So when you do firmware updates, got to use a PC to make, uh, make them work. So we've talked a little bit about the salesy side of things, sonypremiumhome.com. We've talked a little bit about some of the support side of things. So esupport.sony.com. If you need marketing materials, if you need that sort of stuff, I threw my uh, email and information up there in the chat. You can hit me up. Uh, we can see if we can get you hooked up with uh, hero shots and that sort of stuff, if that's what you're looking for. So one other thing that I wanted to look at here, uh, we're gonna switch gears uh, to uh, product briefly, uh, or excuse me, we're gonna switch gears from sharing uh, screens via support and all of that stuff to some product stuff and some live uh, shots here. So um, quick transition from what we're looking at with web pages to the web page that we have for our AVR. So this is what you find if you take a Sony ZA5000, ZA1100, 2100, 3100 out of the box, plug it into the network on the front of the unit you press the ping button and when you get that IP address, open up your browser as long as your phone or tablet are on the same network as the AV receiver, you'll be able to talk to it. You'll get this web, web applet that'll appear. The 810ES, the entry level model to our lineup does not have this capability, but every other model does. A Couple of things I just wanted to show you guys here about this uh, web page is obviously you can configure everything on the AVR at a 3,000 foot view as opposed to clicking through a bunch of uh, settings inside the graphic user interface. So really super easy way to set the unit up. Uh, you can also save configurations. So if you set up one 5,000 ES and you get three or four more down the road and you wanna set them all up the same, you can save these configs and load them into other units. But the one thing that I wanted to make sure that I pointed to here was to talk about speaker size and how to get the best audio performance out of a ZA5000 or out of any Sony receiver for that matter. Is if you go into the speaker setup menu, scroll down here, and when you go to size, if you pick small, it will set all of your speakers to small. It doesn't do anything to the power characteristics of the receiver, but what it does do is it pulls the subwoofer mix out of the main channels. So the benefit is your subwoofer channel is gonna get driven a whole lot harder and you get the added benefit of being able to adjust crossover frequency. So if we're set to large here, I'll just show you really quick. 
we'll go to large. All of my speakers change to large. And now if I try to change crossover frequency, all of those boxes are grayed out. So uh, going back to my car stereo days, it's never a good idea to play a crossover into another crossover. So if we follow along with that kind of logic, same idea applies here. We've still got full range. I've got the fr crossover frequency set as low as possible per channel. So I'm still getting full bandwidth out of my, um, out of my left and right. So if I've got tower speakers, I'm still gonna get full range, but I'm gonna get the added impact of being able to control the bass better and get you know, better impact overall uh, from uh, the bass channel and the product. So Q&A popping up here. Does this internal page exist for VPL series two? So the internal page on which site, Brian, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. If you're talking about this web setup feature, I'm gonna actually talk about um, some software that does this uh, here in a second. It's not actually, uh, there is a way to log into the projector via uh, IP, but there isn't a way to do a setup like this uh, without the specific uh, software. So we'll talk about here, that here uh, in a second. Anything popping up in chat that I can answer? Uh, how can I get a copy of this webinar? Yep, everybody, this is all being recorded. So uh, we could definitely use this as a reference uh, and you can get sick of the bad jokes that I had uh, at the beginning. So um, that's really, all that I wanted to cover here with uh, the AV receivers. One more thing uh, I should mention here as far as performance goes. Um, when we talk about 4K scaling in any device, like a Blu-ray player or, um, uh, I don't know, any scaling that you can you know, add in front of a 4K display, it's typically a good idea to turn the scaling in those devices off unless it's like a really high-end a uh, device like a Lumagen or some, you know, high-end video processor. Uh, typically, this, you know, scaling in a Blu-ray player added to scaling in an AV receiver to the TV that's also, or the projector that's also going to be doing some pixel interpolation or scaling, typically that hurts detail. So your best bet is to set those devices to pass through and then let your display, whether it's a projector or um, television, do the, do the heavy lifting as far as upscaling it's the most sophisticated video device in their setup. So I would, my recommendation would be to use that feature uh, or use that device to do the upscaling, excuse me. But when we scroll down here and we talk about managing um, input signals from other devices, this is really critical. Um, HDMI signal format is a setting where you can change the EDID broadcast of the AV receiver from standard to enhanced format. And really this is important if you're connecting devices that uh, output HDR, you wanna set those inputs to enhanced format. Uh, if you're connecting devices like a PC or a legacy device with like HDMI 1.4 on it, chances are those devices are not gonna jive real good with the enhanced signal format setting. So that's why they come out of the box in the standard format by default. So just kind of keep that in mind if you're, um, out there working with a Sony AV receiver, working with a, any kind of AV system that uh, demands HDR. If you're not getting HDR performance on screen, take a look at settings like HDMI signal format uh, on your audio system, as well as HDMI format on your uh, display or projector. So that's really all I wanted to cover here briefly on- Jason. Yes, sir. A couple of questions I have from George. Um, Dolby Atmos settings. He says mine always come up with uh, Neural X instead of Atmos. So that's because the speaker pattern that you have inside the receiver isn't set up uh, to tell your products uh, that are connected to it that it supports Dolby Atmos. So what you'd want to do here is go for uh, the maximum listening level speakers that you've got and then and I know that this isn't, uh, this isn't, uh, I would say, um, by the book, just to be, just to be perfectly honest here. But if you, if, if you tell it that you've got front or rear speakers wired into the ceiling, you can do that, or you can sort of trick the receiver into saying, Hey, you know, maybe you've got 7.1 at the listener level, or you've got 7.1 speakers, but 
if you set it up for like a 5.1 and then add the extra speakers that you've got as your height speakers, you really need to tell the receiver that you've got some sort of overhead uh, situation going on for you to get Dolby Atmos to pop up on the screen. Also, you need to make sure that you do a firmware update because uh, my, the receiver I have out here in my garage right now uh, still has the previous generation of firmware on it. So I have to go through all of this stuff to do uh, to get Dolby Atmos the, the notification to pop up on the front of the unit, do the firmware update, and you probably won't have to jump through all these hoops to make uh, the Dolby Atmos uh, icon appear on screen. Let's see here in cool. chat. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Um, well, another one, one other question before you move on. Um, can you custom change the 4K scaling on each HDMI input? No, it's not a it's not a by input situation. It's global, and it's just it's the output stage that that does that. This it's not scaled on the input side. It's scaled on the output side, so you can't turn that on by input. But honestly, um, if you just for example, if you take a 1080p signal and you plug it into a 4K TV or a 4K display, if you were going to show it in native 1080p, it would be one quarter of the screen, right? It wouldn't be enti the entire screen. So the TV or the projector is always upscaling all the time with all the signals so it can fill the screen constantly. So adding that scaling in, uh, in you know, artificially in front of the display, again, unless it's something super high end, typically isn't going to yield better results than just running it and pass through. And again, let the display or let the projector do the, the heavy lifting for you. All righty. So talked a little bit about AV receivers and I'm going to keep uh, keep it moving here because uh, I'm going to stop my share and go back to my camera and let's talk a little bit about projectors since we're uh, been talking about projection. A um, couple of quick things and I know we're up against the time crunch here but uh, I want to make sure that we uh, we talk about this stuff and I will also show you guys the software uh, for, for doing some cool things with the projector as well. So uh, for anybody that's missing baseball right now, uh, I decided to throw up a little bit of uh, the show here. So we've got uh, Battle of California, and it looks like the Dodgers are taking it to the Giants right now. So that's, uh, that's good news probably for my, uh, for my LA Dodgers fans. So if we take a look at the menu of the projector here, I'll take a little, see if I can get in a little bit tighter on that for you. That, uh, hopefully that's a little bit sharper. Um, well, I went the wrong way here, sorry guys. Trying to uh, navigate all of the excitement that I've got going on out here in my, uh, out in my garage slash studio. So pardon me for uh, struggling here a little bit. But uh, I get asked a lot about, you know, what are the best picture settings? What, what do you guys use? What do you recommend? What do you think looks best? So again, just bear with me here for one second as I point the camera slightly uh, better at this menu, hopefully, so we can get a little bit better centering and can see some stuff. Um, I, my personal preference is for bright cinema. Uh, and that's usually what I use in my demos. Uh, and really, it strikes the best balance between pop on the screen as well as maintaining uh, black level and that sort of stuff. We scroll over here. Uh, the other one that I would recommend or say is a good one for people is the reference setting. So if you're looking for really high color accuracy right out of the box, a calibrated look right out of the box, if the client's not paying for calibration, going with something like reference or showing them how to use the reference mode in the projector is, is going to get them to that happy place. Also, if you are doing a calibration, starting from the reference mode, or the user mode are your two best baselines. But my personal preference is gonna be for the bright cinema mode. We have other modes built in here, of course, kind of like we do with the TV, and we'll talk about that here shortly. So if the people want a game on the display or game on the projector, the game mode shuts off all of the processing in the projector and you get the fastest uh, refresh rate possible. And we're down in like that nine millisecond range, so really, really, uh, snappy uh, response time or input lag. No, not uh, not the one millisecond that a, a pro gaming display uh, has, but honestly, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week. Unless they're a competitive PC gamer, 
you know, VRR and some of those other features really don't apply to the console space. Um, so I like the bright cinema mode. A couple other things that we can look at here. Cinema Black Pro. Uh, on the laser projector, this is where you're going to adjust the brightness of the laser or the output of the laser. The model that I have out here in my setup is a lamp-based unit. So Cinema Black Pro menu is the iris feature or really how the projector uh, responds to light and dark scenes. My personal preference is to leave it in the full mode so that I get the maximum brightness and then it clamps down to be as dark uh, as possible uh, on a frame by frame basis. If you feel like uh, or your clients are sensitive to any kind of judder or anything like that, that may be a setting that you can look at and adjust or turn off uh, and maybe see if that helps with the situation. I have never personally experienced that. However, I've heard from a few clients that uh, that have uh, epileptic people in their house, that they are sensitive to things that may not be visible to everybody else. So if you run into that, there's my pro tip uh, with the projector, turn the iris and the projector off and it may help with that particular situation. Um, really out of the box, I leave most of the color, brightness and hue, et cetera, uh, alone. Maybe a little shift one way or the other, depending on the environment, but Sony spends a lot of time uh, calibrating these things from the factory. And usually they're in the 90 to 92% uh, accuracy range right out of the box, uh, especially in the reference mode. So I really don't mess around with a whole lot of that. But what I will do is point to a couple of things here in the uh, expert picture settings menu, which is gamma correction. And I'm also going to talk about it when we look at the TV here shortly. But um, the single biggest adjustment that you can make to picture quality is the gamma adjustment. And hopefully that's translating here uh, on the screen. So the higher the number, the, the higher the saturation or the higher the black level is going to be on screen. So if you really want to crush detail, and I'm not sure if it's translating super well here through the camera, but you know, on 2.6 for me, that looks super dark and I've kind of lost some of the zip of the picture. 2.4 strikes a better balance. Uh, a picture quality and black level 2.2 is just a little bit too high and kind of washes out some of the detail, but it also uh, makes it a brighter image. So my advice, again, kind of play around with it based on the application that you guys are working with, but typically 2.2 to 2.4 is where you're probably going to land. The smaller the screen size probably is where you'll go with a 2.4. If it's a little bit bigger, you're going to want to get that extra brightness, but because the screen's a little bit bigger, you'll get some of that uh, black level back. So just a couple of little tricks on um, projector here to get uh, some, you know, nice color out of it. Good looking picture again, right out of the box. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to point to here is um, take a look at HDMI signal format. So this is where we'll adjust the input that we're using on the projector to either standard or enhanced. So again, when we're talking about connectivity uh, with some devices that may be legacy or may not like enhanced signal format, you have that option here. By default, out of the box, it's set to standard. So if you plug in your Apple TV or you plug in some of those devices and you don't get uh, HDR plan, it's because the HDMI signal format is set to the wrong setting uh, on the input that you're using. Uh, also, you can turn the test pattern on and off here. So that may not sound super exciting, but you can use the test pattern uh, that pops out of the projector to calibrate and make sure that you're rectangular on the screen. So this is a really handy tool. Also, if you kind of see like the, the check lines here, these are really indicators to tell you uh, or simulate where screen aspect ratio would be. So the outside one here is 17 by 9. The next one is 16 by nine. The next one in there is four by three. And when you see these horizontal lines, those are actually gonna be your two, three, five uh, marks. So the horizontal down here, sorry, I didn't realize it was cut off in my uh, video there. Uh, that, those will be the indicators for where the, uh, again, a two, three, five with screen would be. And you guys are going, well, maybe that doesn't quite work for me because the image is slightly bigger, or slightly smaller, no big deal because you can actually go back here into the menu, scroll down here to the function menu, turn the test pattern off, off. And now when you hit shift, focus or zoom, 
uh, you're actually using content or using the picture to move the picture around, right? So nice, nice way that you can uh, use content instead of just guesstimating or going back and forth and fighting with a test pattern if you're trying to get the image up on screen properly. So one more thing I'll show you guys on projectors uh, that uh, is a very common question that I get on a regular basis is uh, panel alignment. So sometimes, uh, I'll just say this politely, the people that ship our products maybe don't care for them in the same way that uh, you and I do when we take them out to a customer's job site. We know that this box costs five grand or 10 grand or 60 grand for that matter. So we'll, we'll handle it with care. The guy maybe at the freight office or whatever you may not know what's in that box, may not take the same care or just if it's on a truck or something like that, there's some speed bumps out there on the highways, uh, potholes, those sort of things. So, um, you know, could take some shock along the way. So if you ever get a Sony projector out of the box and you notice that in the text on the menu, you see like red or blue or something like that hanging out. And um, again, I'm going to do my best here to zoom the picture in. That's as tight as I can get. Uh, but let's take a look at panel alignment here. So looking at the screen, and hopefully this is going to translate. Um, this is what you get when you open up the panel alignment menu. And you can either do a shift, you can move the whole panel, or you can do it by zone. But maybe you'll get it out of the box. And I'm going to try and see if I can get the red line to stick out here in the video. Again, hopefully it's translating. But if it's not, yeah, I can sort of see it changing color there on screen. So hopefully it's working for you guys. So this is a worst case scenario uh, where I've got red lines sticking out uh, to the right of my vertical lines and also above my horizontal lines. So that means that panel's taking some kind of shock along the way. How do I correct that? Again, you're just gonna go into the panel shift alignment menu and use the horizontal and vertical cursor keys and your eyes to align up the panels again. So you, know, you can move that red line around so that they all perfectly line back up. It'll sort of snap into like a yellowish green kind of color when you get it perfectly aligned again. Another cool thing that you can do is maybe uh, it's not the entire panel that's out of whack. It's just one part of the menu. So you can go in here by zone. And again, use the cursor here. Try and get it on screen to pick that area, highlight it make whatever adjustment they needed to make, and then you're back in business. So a couple of cool things you can do to improve picture quality, uh, make sure that everything's nice and sharp, make sure that it's all set up properly. And then that's my segue here to go back really quickly to sharing a screen with you to show you the projector software calcul uh, projector calibrator software that I mentioned earlier. And we can get, um, get that answered for you. So I'm seeing some uh, questions in the chat here. How much is of this presentation info as projector is in the units manual? Um, a lot of this is in the user manual for each one of the projectors. Uh, definitely reads like, um, like an instruction manual or, or information uh, like that. Also, we've got uh, some white paper about projector that you can get from our install support team. They can send you uh, an email that has a little bit deeper dive to get that document. Default username for logging into BPL series, the password or the username is root, R-O-O-T in lowercase, and the password is projector with a capital P. Unplugging, uh, I can, if you want to hit me up offline, George, I can hopefully point you in the right direction for uh, TV with network issues, or you could call the install support line 866-924-7669. And then to Brian, um, comprehensive list of devices that require enhanced signal format. So pretty much uh, anything that's going to spit out Dolby Vision, anything that's going to spit out HDR10, uh, is going to really benefit or like those um, that, that enhanced signal format setting change. Uh, it's really devices, legacy devices like HDMI 1.4 uh, or 
um, even 1.0 or PCs really are the other devices that don't typically care for that enhanced signal format setting. Panel alignment does not affect the video signal. It only affects the quality of the picture that you have on screen. So if you were uh, to Courtney, the trick to get them, getting them to sound better, set that speaker to set your front speakers to small. It'll run all the speakers at small. Then you can adjust your crossover points uh, and get a little bit better uh, impact from the subwoofer. And marketing information, you can reach out to me uh, if it's like a screen, if it's a product shot or hero shots or something like that, we can get you hooked up and no special uh, access to get software or firmware for a projector. Just go to esupport.sony.com uh, and you'll be able to get that info there. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here quickly and we'll take a look at Projector Calibrator Pro. And hopefully you guys are all seeing this here on screen now. Uh, this is uh, the software that we use to be able to calibrate a Sony projector from a PC. So the whole idea here is to uh, allow you to do uh, customization faster to do, um, to do that kind of uh, calibration in a faster manner than struggling with your, <clears throat> excuse me, than struggling with uh, menus on screen and that sort of thing. So um, I will send a link to uh, my Dropbox uh, with a, uh, with this software stashed inside it for you guys uh, at the end of this meeting. So stay tuned for that coming out in the blast uh, from the Volutone guys. So you'll be able to download this software, but a couple of cool things that you can do plug the projector into the network by ethernet cable, uh, go here to your settings tab, grab your IP address, type in the IP address into the, into the settings bar here, and then you can talk to the projector. So for example, you can see, you know, which picture mode you're in, I know what your settings are on a global basis, which input you're on, which device you're connected to, that sort of thing. Uh, and then if you want to actually run through the steps of a calibration, you can actually use your PC uh, and the HDMI output on your PC to generate test patterns. One kind of limitation I would point to here, this software does not output HDR test patterns. It doesn't even output 4K test patterns. So you're really doing a base level calibration at 1080p and probably making some adjustments from there uh, on the fly afterwards. But we have all of those capabilities built in here. And again, you can do standard calibration where it literally is just like a wizard and you run through all the things on your device. And then again, you can go deep on it and do a gamma adjustment, do PC dynamic range checks, do all of those things to maximize uh, the outcome or the output of your um, calibration. You also have test patterns that are built inside here. So if you're using the HDMI output on your laptop as a second screen or a second display, you can connect the HDMI out of your laptop to the input on the projector or the input on your AV system and calibrate through those devices. So pretty handy tool. You can also use this, of course, with any of the calibration equipment that you guys would prefer to use, but just use this to interface with the projector. You can also save configurations here. So you can actually save it as a file, export the CMS file, save it, put it in another project. You just import it and use that calibration as the base functionality or the base uh, foundation for what you're doing with that, um, you know, with that projector. Stop the share here. We'll go back to chat really quickly before we click over. Can't you see all of these settings on the projection screen? Yes, you can, Bob. But the whole idea behind the software is to speed up the time that it takes you to do a calibration. So if you're already using your laptop to maybe program the system, get it set up and rocking, you can absolutely use the remote in your hand, no big deal. But if you're taking it to the point of calibrating with a colorimeter, you know, pattern generator, that sort of stuff, it takes time for the menus and those things that pop up on screen to go away and for the camera to settle down, as opposed to if you just had it on your laptop screen, 
you can make those adjustments much, much faster without having to take the time for, for every different setting or every different thing that you do to, uh, to chill out. And, you know, again, time is money. So uh, we've done the Pepsi challenge on this with a couple of our ISF guys. And with the menus uh, on screen and the remote in your hand, they're on the two and a half to three hour mark using the PC software. They're in the, you know, hour, hour and 15 minute range to do the same calibration. So pretty significant improvement in efficiency and time. New receivers are compatible with HDMI 2.0 cables, yes. I use, must use a PC, I'm a Mac guy. Uh, unfortunately, the software is built for uh, PC. So if you load uh, maybe a partition in your hard drive and load some Windows software on your Mac, you can emulate a, a PC through your Macintosh. Not trying to tell you uh, what to do with your, uh, with your computer, obviously, but just telling you that those are the, uh, the conditions that uh, we're dealing with out there. Will, be so will Sony be upgrading this web page to support 4K or 8K calibrations? Again, it's not a web page, it's software. So I imagine that we will see an update in software to allow us or to give us that, uh, to give us that uh, 4K or 8K capability when those things become available. There's no 8K projector currently, so uh, we've got a little ways yet before we need to worry about that. Okay, so hopefully you guys are all seeing my television uh, menu here on screen. So we've got about 15 minutes or so to run through some of the hits uh, that I get on Sony TVs uh, most often. So we'll take a look here uh, at the... Uh, at the menu, so a couple of things. Of course, this is what you see by and large when you take the thing out of the box. You've got a ton of you know, what I would call essentially wall acne. And people start getting freaked out or glaze over when they see that sort of stuff. So a couple of things you can do really quickly to clean those up is if you just kind of scroll down and scroll over here to the left, you can delete those by row. Or you can just scroll down to the bottom of the screen and where it says customize channels, you can defeat all that stuff uh, from this menu. So you can just kind of scroll through here and turn those things off so that they don't appear uh, in the main menu of the screen. Uh, so again, if you're trying to utilize the TV as the hub of your streaming experience, et cetera, um, you wanna make sure that's as clean as possible and easy for your clients to manage as possible. So again, you can kind of tailor what that looks like for them. Also, uh, in order for you to get apps that are not loaded to the TV by default, you have to sign the TV into a Gmail account. So there's going to be uh, things that, are, that will appear by default uh, built into the TV. But anything beyond that, if, you, if your customers want to take advantage of them or load them on the TV, um, they've got to sign the TV into a Gmail account to get access to the app store. A couple of cool things you can do here, of course, is you can grab these apps and you can organize them in the way that you think is most suited for the viewing experience for the client. And again, this is really just a nod to, hey, you know, using the TV as a streaming platform is becoming far more popular uh, and far more reliable, quite frankly. So here's a couple of things you can do with the TV to kind of tweak it out without taking it to the pro mode level, without putting it in the monitor mode to just clean up the user experience uh, from this point. Same thing here in the input section. You can get in here and you can edit uh, the inputs that appear right in, the, right in the main menu of the TV. So if you really wanna tailor the experience that, you're, uh, that your clients are seeing or experiencing, all of the things that are be available to them you know, by input or by an app, can be uh, added or defeated here. So if you wanted to lock the TV down to a single HDMI input and that's all they have, you can do that here in this menu again without putting it in the pro mode, uh, you know, monitor only mode. So without software, you can really kind of tailor the experience. Obviously your client could get back in here and turn things back on, mess around with it, but uh, by and large, if you're managing that experience from a remote control, they'll never see any of this stuff um, and they won't, you know, it won't be an issue for you, it won't be an issue for them. 
scroll uh yeah i want to go ahead and just back out of this thank you so much um up here in the top right hand corner of the screen we've got our settings tab and again i'm not going to go through every single <laughs> menu item here because we don't have the time and uh we have uh dedicated uh technical videos and stuff that we're putting together that will walk you through all this stuff but uh making sure that we get the most out of today I just want to talk about the things that are the, you know, the most critical to getting the best picture out of a Sony TV possible. So you take the TV out of the box, you sign it into a Gmail account so that uh, you can get apps on the TV if that's what you want to do. Put the TV on the network, and then you're going to go ahead and start setting it up for picture quality. First thing you want to do is go into the watching TV menu and click on where it says external inputs. Click on this option, and you're going to see a few things pop up here. Bravia Sync settings are going to be where you're going to see CEC devices up here. So if you want to turn things on and off, the TV on and off from uh, an external device, or turn on or control an external device from the TV remote, you got to turn on uh, these features here. Again, this is for CEC control. But when we talk about picture quality, HDMI signal format, is the menu that you need to get into. So if you're putting an Apple TV on a display, you're putting a PlayStation or an Xbox on the display, and you get messages that pop up on the screen that say either HDCP error, or you get a message that says, uh, I'm capable of HDR. Your display is capable of HDR, but there's a setting that's not right. And you will see that message uh, specifically from PlayStation. I'm not sure what the message is from um, Xbox. Uh, Again, I don't have one of those, unfortunately, but I know that you will get a, a, a message that will pop up on screen that will tell you, hey, there's chances are that you could be getting a better picture here. Got to change that uh, change the setting in your input or on the display to get it. Got to go to HDMI signal format and select the enhanced signal format mode. So I know that there was a list or there was a request for a list of uh, devices that would like enhanced versus standard. Again, a good rule of thumb is if it's an HDR capable product, it's gonna want that enhanced signal format. If it's an older DVD or older Blu-ray player uh, or a current PC, chances are it's gonna want standard. So the TV can manage that setting by input. So you can set some of them to enhanced and some of them to standard, totally up to you. But I just wanna make sure that we talk about that. Um, Again, we've got four inputs available here. And, uh, you know, TV is pretty well equipped as far as that goes. Um, the new TV sets, the new current generation ones uh, from X900H and up will support enhanced audio return channel. So you'll be able to get um, Dolby Atmos support from apps in the TV or sources that are connected directly to the display. If we take a look here at the uh, display and sound settings, these are questions that I get asked constantly. What's the, what's the best picture mode? What's the hottest picture setting? What, what should I use? Uh, of course, we're going to travel off into another dimension here. Hang on a second. Hang on for one second. Let's do this. Let's turn on my Blu-ray player. And I'm controlling all of this with CEC. So similar experience to what... Uh, what your clients could get if you're uh, if you guys are using CEC or not. Go here to drone flights, and we'll just get some content playing. Eventually, go there. We go. All right. So we're looking at some content here, and we're going to start doing some picture adjustments. Again, what are the most important ones to make? What are the ones that make the biggest difference? Uh, you got a couple of different ways to get to that menu. You can either hit the gear on the remote and you get the quick pop-up from the bottom of the screen. Uh, or again, you can hit the home menu button and it'll open up the, uh, the picture menu in the, from the top right-hand corner. You have my recommendation. You really have two options for watching Blu-rays, cable, that sort of stuff that I think are, are the right ones to go with. The standard picture setting out of the box is by and large probably the best out of the box picture setting that we've got for the general kind of content that customers are gonna look at or watch. They're not, um, 
if they're not paying for calibration, if they're not taking it to that level, the standard picture mode setting generally is going to be a great place to start from or to use. However, if they're looking for a more calibrated look on the display, my recommendation is to go with custom. And custom, you'll notice, and I'm not sure if it's translating here uh, through, the, through the internet, hopefully it is, but the image gets a lot flatter. It's not doing any uh, picture or color enhancement, and it's the most uh, true to life representation of the content that you're actually putting into the TV. Again, if you want a little bit of, uh, want it zhuzhed up a little bit, but not looking super artificial, the standard picture mode is gonna add some processing in, it's gonna add a little bit of color in, and again, generally give you a, an overall more eye-pleasing um, picture on screen, however, not the most accurate. So I get asked a lot, like what's the, what's the one setting I can make to a TV to get picture quality out of it or what's the shortcut? And I'll say with a Sony TV, it's usually really two things. It's gonna be light sensor on and off. So if you've got a really bright room, you probably want to turn that light sensor off. If you've got a bedroom or something like that, you probably want to leave that light sensor on and let the, let the intelligence of the TV adjust to uh, brightness settings, uh, you know, based on the environment. But when we go here into the brightness setting actually of the TV, the biggest single adjustment that you can make is to gamma. So pick a picture mode that you think looks good, go to the gamma setting, and with the standard picture mode, it's going to be at uh, you know zero, which is kind of right in the middle. But maybe I'd like a little bit more black level. With an LED TV set, you want to take gamma away, or you want to turn the gamma curve down to get black level back. So again, I'm not sure if it's translating through the camera, but here to my eye, yeah, zero is bright, but I, I'd maybe like a little bit more black, a little bit better. Uh, saturation, a little bit better contrast, the gamma is that adjustment, that, that one single adjustment that you can make. Uh, with LEDs, LED, LCD TV sets specifically, you want to turn the gamma down because that's going to give you black level back. Turning this number up is going to elevate the gamma level, so elevate the black level, elevate the brightness. On an OLED TV set, the opposite is true. So with an OLED set, the black level is so high that you want the extra brightness to overcome the black level. So with an OLED set, I would typically go from a zero to maybe a plus one or plus two, depending on the environment that I'm in. I've got an A9G in my living room and I'm running gamma plus two right now because it's a bright time of year and there's longer periods of, of the day that it's uh, bright than when it's not. So I like the extra elevated brightness. I like the extra elevated color that turn this setting uh, up and down gives me. So again, Quick rule of thumb with LED, LCD, pick a picture mode, go to the gamma setting and adjust it down a little bit to get some black level back. With an OLED, pick your picture mode that you like, go to the gamma setting and turn the gamma up a couple of clicks to get some color back to, uh, and to get some brightness back. Um, looking here, uh, also at a couple other things in the menu for the TV, we'll go here to the settings tab. Um, display and sound, this is a big one. Uh, and it's really relative when we're talking about making the TV the center of the entertainment experience for our clients. So we're relying on the smart features in the TV, we're relying on the apps in the TV, that sort of stuff. We go here to audio output. So if we're connecting the display to an external AV system, we probably want to go ahead and turn the audio system on or turn the speakers in the TV off. If we're connected to it via HDMI, if we're doing eARC or ARC, we want to prioritize the audio system in Bravia Sync so that every time the TV knows when I turn on, I've got to make sure that my audio output's working and I'm connected to that device. These other modes here really don't make any difference, home theater control or home mode sync. Again, you've got to have a compatible AV receiver connected to the TV to take advantage of those. This option here, AV Sync, is a big one. So if you're getting uh, some kinds of delay or if you're getting a lot of latency between the output on the TV and the input on your audio device, AV sync setting is really where you want to get in here and do some testing and doing some looking. Uh, I'll say this, news stations typically are the ones that are going to be the biggest offenders. 
when it comes to AV sync. It's a grindhouse production facility there. They don't care if um, the mouth and the sound are time aligned coming out of their studio. So when it lands at your cable box, you could be getting them slightly, again, out of sync. So using this setting here will pretty much determine where that lag is coming from. My advice would be to leave the uh, AV sync turned on all the time and use the off or the auto setting uh, to do some testing with to see if, uh, see if, you know, where the, you know, the, where the lag or where the biggest delay is coming from and, you know, illustrate that for your clients. Um, hopefully your soundbar or your, your audio devices that you're connected to outside of this will give you some kind of timing adjustment because really here it's an, it's an intelligent feature. It's a constantly on feature or it's a turn it off feature. So if you're noticing that the dialogue or the, the mouths are moving ahead of the sound, turn the AV sync off because it's that extra delay timing that's, that's keeping, that, uh, keeping those mouths and stuff out of sync from each other. Uh, scrolling down here, uh, enhanced audio return channel. If we want to do multi-channel audio capability from our apps back to our audio system by of HDMI, we've got to turn eARC on. The digital audio output setting on a Sony TV, this is for the optical output on the back of the unit. My advice would be to use PCM. It's the most stable and it sounds the best. You do have other options here for multi-channel if you want to try those or use those. But typically for boxes like Sonos specifically, the, they're going to like the PCM setting the best and they're going to sound the best as a result. You got the option here to turn the volume up and down on the digital optical output. I'm not exactly sure why uh, you'd want that, but you can adjust the volume for PCM. And again, that volume level is only for PCM uh, audio. So setting that, uh, setting that setting to PCM is going to be like a global volume setting for the digital output. And then last but not least is this one. And I know that uh, I've taken a few calls from some volume tone dealers and some direct dealers alike where they're trying to get the TV to output DTS. or they're trying to get the TV to output Dolby Atmos from sources that are connected to the TV, not from the apps. The app will work fine, but they play their Blu-ray player and it comes out in stereo. It's because this setting by default comes out of the box in off. So go to the audio menu, go to the pass-through setting and set auto now. And it even says it there in the description. It even says, I want to pass through audio signals as they're intended automatically like DTS, et cetera. So your Dolby Atmos sources, your 5.1 sources that are coming in from a Blu-ray player, et cetera, gaming console, what have you, set the audio to uh, pass-through mode and you'll get multi-channel surround sound from your uh, enhanced audio return channel devices, et cetera. And let's see here. See if there's any other questions I can answer for anybody. Uh, we're kind of, we're running a few minutes past here, Gary. So um, I will just. Yeah, no, it's good. I, mean, I think it's great. You still have 45 people on there. So guys, I would suggest let's use Q&A right now if there is anything really pressing. It's funny, Bob wrote, what is CEC? And I was like, yeah, Savage, what's CEC? Yeah, so that's consumer electronic control, basically. So CEC is the Bravia, you know, Sony calls it Bravia link, but basically it's a, uh, a protocol to control other devices via HDMI using one remote. So in essence, a Sony TV connected to a Sony AV receiver, Sony uh, PlayStation, Sony Blu-ray player for that matter, uh, I can control all those devices using the Sony remote without programming anything. Uh, CEC is not just a Sony thing. Uh, Crestron uses CEC in their, uh, their DX um, video distribution hubs and that sort of stuff. So you can, they can turn on displays, they can turn on devices just using uh, CEC control, just using the interface that passes through um, the HDMI cable. So it's a really handy, uh, really handy way to be able to control I would say maybe a little less complicated systems in a lot of ways. So if you're just doing a streamlined like Apple TV, television and remote soundbar kind of thing, CEC control is, is killer because you only have to teach the customer how to use one remote and it's the remote that came in the box. 
Mm. Um, and you get the added benefit of audio uh, performance that goes along with it. Uh, in order to take advantage of ARC or in order to take advantage of enhanced audio return channel, you got to use, uh, you got to turn the CEC control and the Bravia Lake stuff on. So it's kind of like, uh, do you want to use a control system externally and manage these things yourself? You have that option. If you want to use the built-in control net, you want to use the built-in capability, then we have that option as well. You can use uh, CEC with a, you can even use CEC and a third-party control system if you want. Just simple IR commands to the TV. Those devices that are uh, connected via CEC will get the same uh, control capability as if you were using the factory remote. Got it. You know, speaking of audio, uh, Courtney had a couple questions. Um, is there any trick to get a Sony AVR to sound better? Example, Sony AVRs need to be played at a higher volume level uh, other than the AVRs to get the same audible listening level. Have you got any questions regarding that? Yeah, I, I tried to answer that briefly when I was reading through the text before we clicked over here. But yeah, I, as I was saying in the settings menu there, you know, a, a big one that I would say is setting those that front speakers to small because oh, yeah. the, 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 the channel gets a little muddy just just being honest, I think the, the audio channels in large get a little bit muddy because it mixes the LFE channel in with the mains. So you've got some super low bass extension happening through the, you know, the main channel speakers. You know, relative to the volume setting on the dial versus the competition, you know, Sony's not, you know, Sony's not trying to be at, you know, 150 dB at minus 20, where maybe that's the goal of another of another manufacturer or something like that. So, uh, you know, making the adjustments from absolute to relative volume display would probably be a little bit fairer comparison to maybe what, you know, some of our competitors are doing on the zero to a hundred scale. But my, my number one advice for getting better audio quality out of a Sony receiver, again, is to set those front speakers to small, set your crossover points all the way down to 40 on all your channels it'll pull all that subwoofer mix out of the main channel speakers and give you far better uh, clarity uh, throughout the rest of the channels, just because it's pulling that LFE mix out. So, right. Which, which we illustrated earlier. So you guys, uh, when you go back and watch the video, you'll see how Jason uh, and the other options were on those menus. Um, Sharif. Hey, Sharif. Hey buddy. Good to see, Good to have you on board. He was saying, um, will Sony be adding streaming apps such as ATT? or Spectrum? So Sony is working every day with our partners at Google to try to make sure that we've got um, the latest and greatest. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna switch to my, uh, I'm gonna switch to my Death Star view here. So it sounds like I'm, you know, far more ominous than I really am. <laughs> but um, we, we are working with the, uh, we're working with Google. And honestly, that's the, that's the people that are, you know, navigating the, Bring, our, bring your apps to us uh, space. So we know that we've got a couple that our competitors don't have built into the TV, you know, Disney Plus, we've got support for Dolby Vision and stuff like that that our competitors don't have. But uh, currently we don't have a Spectrum app and we don't have a Comcast app. They are things that we're working on, but I don't have a hard timeline for when, uh, for when that's gonna happen or when those are gonna appear. Got it. Um, Bob had also asked another question a couple minutes ago, Jason. He had a customer complaining about the faint right bar on the right third of his screen. Is this a burn-in or something that can be removed with software with a software update adjustment? Uh, anything with that? So it depends on the TV. So OLED sets are the only ones that will burn in. So if there are an OLED customer and they are Fox News watchers or any cable news watchers, I'm not trying to throw rocks at uh, any, any political news stations out there. Um, I'm, I'm politically neutral. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, I was going to say OLED sets are susceptible to burn in. So it's not a good idea to watch those kinds of uh, stations constantly on an OLED set. An LED set will not burn in. So an, a typical LED LCD set will not burn in. So any kind of like faint bars or anything like that that might be appearing on screen uh, are from maybe content or something else going on. Uh, if the OLED sets, if it's an OLED set and it's exhibiting some sort of image retention on it, <coughs> pardon me, there's a feature called uh, 
panel refresh that you can go into the menu. I don't, I don't have an OLED set out here. I can't show you where it is in the menu, but it's in the, uh, I think it's in the uh, picture menu for the OLED sets. Um, you can get in there and do a panel refresh. It takes about an hour, but it will go on a pixel by pixel basis and do its best to reverse any image retention or burn in on the mm. substrate. And I have to say this, except for extreme cases where customers, you know, were watching, you know, Fox news. I keep throwing Fox news out there because this, that was what the customer watched literally all day and night. And then when they wanted to go watch something else, they've got Fox news in their corner of their screen, uh, except for extreme cases like that. The, uh, that panel refresh uh, has been able to resolve that issue. That's something that's inherent uh, with OLED sets. So just like plasma TVs back in the day were susceptible to burn in, you don't want to, you don't want to play uh, Mario uh, on your plasma TV for you know ten hours straight because bad things can happen. Same thing applies with OLED sets. You can game on them. You can watch Fox News on them. You can do that sort of stuff but you want to mix up the content. You want to switch it to other channels. You want to watch other things on occasion to make sure that you're you know, minimizing any kind of image retention or <clears throat> banners that are constantly on the screen. Wow, thank you so much. You know what, I'm going to stop the recording at this point, but um, uh, 